So, so today, um, it's a little disjointed. We've been talking about um, fluid pressures uh, at, a, at a point and resolving those into forces. All of the systems we've worked with have been static systems. So we're looking at fluid statics still in week three. Of course, this is week four, uh, the beginning of it. But what we'll do is we'll now look at the same expressions for fluid statics, but look at accelerating fluids. And that might seem like a, an oxymoron to you that we're talking about acceleration in static fluids. But what it means is that the container that the fluid in is in is accelerating. And so this is the result of a, an earthquake. This uh, sloshing backwards and forwards in this particular case is the result of an earthquake. Some of you, if you live in the east, uh, would have lived through this. The Mineral Springs 2011 earthquake uh, in Mineral Springs, Virginia, um, which was around August of 2011. I can remember sitting in my office and feeling the building swaying and it's, it kept on swaying for long enough that it certainly wasn't a, a short, sharp impact from a, a truck or something uh, accidentally running into the building. You just feel this, this kind of easy motion with kind of a long period to it. And uh, it was a, an earthquake in um, Virginia. Just slip on a fault, not injection related, uh, but um, related just to natural release of... Uh, Shifting along faults, um, it damaged the Washington Monument, it damaged the Washington Cathedral, the National Cathedral in D.C., uh, and uh, it actually was quite a, it was maybe a, a magnitude 6 earthquake, I can't remember, uh, but it was certainly felt here. And so if you're living in the East Coast um, six years ago, you, you might have felt it. It was mid-afternoon, two, 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I seem to recall. I seem to recall some of my colleagues running out of the building as well, but uh, I'm not sure that's exactly what you're supposed to do when you feel an earthquake. You're more likely to get hit by things falling off the building and killing you than... I, I'm not sure what the conventional wisdom is these days for, for dealing with uh, an earthquake, whether you're supposed to evacuate if you know before it happens. We don't have that. Okay. And so this is actually the one of the best things. This was sent by one of the colleagues, uh, one of your predecessors, he sent this video of a uh, of water trap between two panes of glass on a bus. And at some stage, this bus is going to take off. And you'll see that as it leaves, uh, it's accelerating. It goes from zero miles an hour to something else. And this skipping rope is actually the water level caught between the two panes of the glass. And it merely makes the point that when you accelerate, um, if it's going to do it, stopped it right now, uh, you get an inclination of that <coughs> surface. And so what, this is exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about fluids in a container where that container is accelerated. This one doesn't want to uh, do what it's attempting to do. Let's see if I restart it, it will actually do something. Uh, moving slowly. The car is moving and the bus isn't at that stage, it's just relative motion. And the bus starts going and you see as it reaches, as it accelerates, it changes the level. It's not particularly smooth and therefore the surface you get isn't smooth. But you see that when you accelerate, it goes up at the back as if you're bulldozing the water. And when you decelerate to a stop, it goes the other way and it uh, has a slope in the opposite direction. So that's really what we're talking about. And so it's relevant to things like fuel tanks in uh, tanker planes, I imagine. I imagine it's relevant to, to fuel tanks uh, or tanker cars on uh, railroads. Uh, you see uh, in... So, that's uh, a pretty interesting video. Not sure what else we've got. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, if, if, if this is an ocean, the wet lake may take off, and it has fuel in it, wouldn't that just... Where's the, where does the fuel reside on a plane? Yeah, so it can't really go for it anywhere. It, it it would attempt to back up, but because it's in the honeycomb of the wings, it's compartmentalized. It's going to try and shift, but it's not going to be able to shift. And so um, I imagine that they have, would close compartments off, and so it's pretty well distributed. So that um, I imagine even if it shifts a little bit within the wings, not to make much difference. I guess practically it doesn't, right? We know because we survived plane flights. Hopefully. 
it's good when the number of landings is equal to roughly the number of takeoffs, right? Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, so that's uh, one video. So uh, other examples of this, not so related to this particular one, but this is kind of a cool figure. Related to instabilities. So here there are two, two fluids within a tank, one denser than the other one. And so um, Helmholtz instabilities are where you change the inclination angle of these two fluids. So I guess I uh, don't want to wait for all of this. I want to move further. Okay. And so these two fluids exist, so now if you change the elevation of the bottom one, the dense fluid will tend to move down and the orange one down and the white one up. And as a result of this, you get these instabilities developing, which you can't, oh yeah, you can see, it's, it's quite amazing, isn't it? These little waves, as you have one shearing across the top of the other one. The density drives the, the orange fluid down and the white fluid, clear fluid up. And that, due to that drag, the viscosity between them, um, you develop a... Uh, an interface which evolves into, so it's moving even though you can't really see it moving, and then all of a sudden you generate these beautiful waves. Kelvin uh, Helmholtz instabilities is what they call it. So, not so related to what we're talking about today, but, but you see them in the sky as well, and so I'll leave it at that. So they occur in nature. I don't want to do... And so the other application of this, uh, if you've looked at the exam uh, questions, Certainly one of the exam questions was the, the idea of, we've used it as an example in this class, you take a piece of Tigon tubing, hose pipe, and you swing it around your head. If you pre-prime that tubing with water and swing it around your head, obviously the water in that hose is being pulled in tension exactly the same way the hose is, and the water wants to flow out. So the net result of that is that you generate a suction in that hose by spinning it around. And so a centrifugal pump isn't all that different from this. This is the motion of a blade that goes around. It, in spinning around, it pushes the water out centrifugally, centrifugally cent with centripetal force to the outside. If it gets pushed to the outside, then it has to suck more fluid on, on the inside. And that's the mechanism by which a, a centripetal or centrifugal pump works. And so uh, it's useful in uh, as a machine to be able to to move fluids. And I'll leave that one for later. Maybe we'll come back to that. All right? So that's what we want to talk about uh, today. We'll talk about acceleration. So the idea is that we're talking about <coughs> accelerations of a container that contains a fluid. And we have the expressions to be able to basically to, to deal with that. And so, what we're attempt to do today is deal with these. One is linear acceleration. Accelerations. We've had enough when we derive the expressions that look at the fluid pressure change within a static fluid. We actually had the foresight to derive a set of expressions that also included the magnitudes of accelerations, and so. We're already really there in terms of what we need for um, the, the linear equations. And what you might remember was that we basically took a, a volume and so if this is for uh, linear equations, if in this volume we gave it an acceleration and we chose a coordinate system that looked something like this, as you remember. Then, for example, uh, we said that we could, if we wanted, apply an acceleration in the z-direction. And if we did that, then we got this expression here, which I'll just remind us of, and that is that the change in pressure in the z-direction minus unit weight is equal to rho AC. So what we'd always done was we threw this term away 
And if we did that, then we only had to deal with the other part. And of course, this was the part that gave us the fact that the change in pressure is always equal to minus the unit weight. And this is what we've used to get things like the pressure at a point is equal to the pressure at some reference point plus the unit weight times the change in height. And we've been using that for the last couple of weeks and then um, built on that to be able to look at forces applied at a, at a system. And so what we can do now is we can actually take it so that we improve the proportion. We don't put it equal to zero. And we would like to do two things, as you can imagine. We'd like to know, first of all, um, what is the inclination of the free surface? Of the free surface. As we saw, for instance, in the bus glass. And the second question we might ask is, how does pressure vary with depth? So those are the two things that we would like to maybe answer, and two things we will answer today. And we'll address those, and then we'll do exactly the same for rotation. We'll, we'll come back to that. We'll do the first one first. And so, well, you know, I can't help myself from actually, I think it's important that you understand exactly where these expressions come from, even though typically you're not asked to do that in an exam. Um, but it's important to be able to figure out exactly where they come from. And so we know these expressions. Uh, we've used these. We've developed them in the first place. So what we're going to attempt to do is to answer these two questions by using this suite of very straightforward equations. And just by manipulating them in some particular way. And the result that we'll get would be, first of all, this, this is the main expression that we'll end up with. We'll, we'll get that. So that's where we're, we're headed. So here's the idea. We know you can imagine from what we've already seen that if you accelerate a fluid horizontally, and so we're talking about accelerating, so not just a velocity. So if I'm walking across with your beaker, then it's not a velocity that does it. It has to be acceleration that, that uh, allows this to happen. Uh, and that is that if we move something horizontally, then we'd expect that we'd pile it up. It's just like actually, it's actually not so diff different from a storm surge, except the storm surge, the force that's being applied to the fluid is friction on the top of the water, just kind of pile it, pushing it up and bulldozing it. Here we're kind of bulldozing it with a blade from behind, as you might imagine on the back side of this, you could think of this. And so what we want to do is we want to reuse the expressions we had. And so we've seen all of these. We derived these maybe at the beginning of the second week in 2.1. And so what we can do, uh, we can first of all look at exactly what our coordinate system is. We use our right-handed coordinate system. X and Y are in the horizontal plane. Z is vertically upwards, positive upwards, uh, as shown here. And... So if we take this system of equations that we already have, uh, we just had them on the first page a second ago, if we look at accelerating a fluid in a tank, and we accelerate it, in this case, either in the y direction or the z direction, it could be either one, right? could be, if this is my coordinate system, x is pointing at you, y is pointing across the room, and z is pointing upwards. So this would be a y acceleration. This would be a z acceleration. <laughs> this would be a z acceleration, and it'd be minus z when I fall over, of course, um, which is gravity acting. And so these are accelerations that are physically applied to this, to this bucket container of water. And so, in the particular cases we'll look at, we're going to assume that we don't accelerate in the x direction because that's too complicated. Adding that extra one. So if we take this expression here. We're going to make this equal to zero, and we're going to keep these other two. And that's exactly what we see here. 
And so we'd like to attack these two questions. What is the inclination of the surface that we get when we move it from A to B, uh, when we accelerate? And how does the pressure change as we go down within the depth of this fluid that might have an inclined surface to it? Does it behave just as we uh, would expect in a static fluid? It varies linearly with the unit weight, or does it change in some way? So first things first. We want to know exactly what this inclination of this surface is. So what we could do is we could take note that we could get some change in pressure. And we could write that change in pressure as a change in pressure in the x direction, a change in pressure in the y direction, and a change in pressure in the z direction. And so if we're looking at how pressures change as we go in each of these directions, then if the directions are orthogonal to each other, then a vector in any one of those directions has no influence on the other direction. They're completely independent, mathematically independent. And so what we've written here is that if we want to get a change of pressure, we can do it to a change of pressure in the x direction, in the y direction, in the z direction. They're all independent of each other. So we're not actually getting three times dp in this case. We're actually getting just one. And what we could do is that we could multiply each one of these by one and by one and by one. Right? We haven't really violated anything yet. And that's exactly what's written on the bottom um, expression, just written slightly differently. And now, in this expression here, just by writing it slightly differently, we have a change in pressure in the x direction, which actually is going to be zero, because of we've chosen not to have an acceleration in the x direction. But we've chosen to keep an acceleration in the y direction and the z direction. So what we could do is we could substitute for these components right here. I know that looks like a, a row, but it's actually a P. And if we make those substitutions, this substitution here is just this expression here. And this substitution here includes both the acceleration we're giving it and also gravity, which still acts. And this is the acceleration we're giving it in the y direction uh, that goes in separately. So these are the two components that go in here. And so we have an expression that defines exactly how pressure changes in, in our system. So the other observation we have is that if we look, and I can't get it on at the same time, I know some of you are scribbling this down. If you look at the characteristics of this surface of the water, at this particular point here, the pressure is atmospheric. At this pressure here, the atmos pressure is atmospheric. So as we go along this inclined surface, the one thing we do know about it is that the pressures don't change. So the change in pressure, dp, is zero. So what we should be able to do is put this equal to zero. And then what we have are two components of this equation, both of which are equal to zero. They, we can set them equal to each other. They have a change in elevation of the surface with horizontal location embedded in them. So we could write this equation in terms of uh, dz dy, how z changes as we go horizontally in the y direction, which of course is the slope of the surface. And if we do that, then we end up with this expression, which in a previous edition of the book is 2.28. I don't know if it's still that number as we've gone through other um, editions, but that's basically the, the expression we have. So it says that the inclination of this surface is some function of the accelerations. And if we know what those accelerations are, then we can get exactly what that is. And so for the example, uh, so, so AY is acceleration we apply in the y direction. AZ is acceleration in the z direction apart from gravity. In other words, if we're going up in an elevator. And G is just gravity. And so 
a very simple exposition of this. I don't really know what the um, the elevation was in the bus. It looked at some stage that it was almost one on one. It, uh, let's not take one on one. Let's take it as uh, uh, f five on ten. So one on two, maybe. So if we do that, if that's the inclination of the surface in the bus, then this is z. dz is equal to 1. y is equal to 2. Um, of course, it's equal to negative that, right? So if you have your x and y coordinate system like this, this is a positive gradient, this is a negative gradient, right, by definition. And so that is equal to the acceleration in the y direction divided by g plus the acceleration in the z direction. Acceleration in the z direction would be if you're accelerating up a hill, right? And it's pretty much horizontal. And so in this, what we have um, relative to our coordinate frame this is saying that uh, the acceleration in the y direction half g, quite a lot. So you're accelerating at half a g to get that, if that really is the um, inclination. If you're going at 1 g, it would be 1 on 1, so it would be a 45 degree inclination. At it. And we know that it, it goes up to a maximum as you accelerate. As you decelerate, it takes the opposite uh, canter. And this, this magnitude changes, meaning that the acceleration is in the opposite direction. So it's quite interesting and useful that we can do that. Yes? Isn't G almost always negative? G, G, a number in, in all the expressions that you'll use, is a positive constant, and it applies in the negative direction. So G is a positive number here, and it's taken care of in the fact that it comes out to be uh, negative within these particular equations. So G is a positive constant. It is all, always positive. Acceleration. So we would use 9.81 meters per second. 9.81 meters per second squared, yes. If you're on this planet. Okay. So, so, so in other words, you could use the bus uh, window as a, an accelerometer, right, in some respects. I think that's kind of interesting. So that's the first of our questions. What's the inclination? Um, if, for instance, we were accelerating upwards in an elevator... Um, with a, a bucket of water, then what would the inclination be? G would be 9.81. AZ, if we were going positively upwards, would be another positive number. And so AY, if we're not going horizontally, would be zero. And so the, the slope of our water would be flat. If we're going straight up, it would just remain flat. If we're going straight down, it would just remain flat as well. And so those mechanisms are self-evident. So that was the first question we posed ourselves. Second question is how do uh, pressures change as we go uh, vertically up or down? And so we can look at that again. So what is that? If we go up or no, sorry. If we go up or down in the fluid when we're accelerating, how do those magnitudes change? Well, the pressure change with C is given by this expression here. And so you'll know that when we looked at a static fluid, we always got the magnitude that Tp over dz is equal to minus um, rho times uh, g. This is gamma, right? But now we have this extra term, which is minus rho times az. So minus rho times g plus az. So we can see from this that we're changing the pressure distribution, and we know exactly what that pressure dif distribution means if we kind of draw it. Whoops. Where did we go? If we draw this pressure distribution out, this is pressure. We know that if we, oh, that's a nice color. We know that if we just draw this out, 
Change in pressure is dp. Change in z is this. And so we've done this on the, the very first times we met. This magnitude here, dp is equal to um, instead of being this is 1 and this being rho g, it's rho g plus az. So what it means is that as it goes down, the pressure that you feel as you go down in this fluid, if it's accelerating upwards, would be larger. And it's drawn at the bottom of this page, I think. Well, I won't move it off there. Is it just changes the magnitude by which the pressure changes. And so uh, this is the standard result as we go down here. This is the idea here. So normally as we go down, we have a pressure change which is equal to just the unit weight of fluid multiplied by the depth that we go below the surface. If we're accelerating upwards, then instead of being this magnitude, it's amplified by some amount. If we're going upwards, as you can imagine, it's the same as you'd feel in your body, right? The elevator starts going up, you feel yourself sink in your shoes because you have inertia and you're being forced against that inertia by the, 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 the elevator is bulldozing your feet and moving you up, up uphill. The opposite is the true is as you start to go down, is that the acceleration would be in the opposite direction. So this would be a negative acceleration, so you'd be subtracting it. And so the pressure that you'd feel would be less than that. And I think we made the point in one of our classes, looking at um, kayakers falling off the edges of waterfalls. What is the pressure that's present within that droplet in the waterfall as it flows downwards? It's weightless, right? Because it's falling under an acceleration due to, to gravity. And so it has an acceleration which is equal to uh, minus g in the vertical direction. These cancel out exactly, and the pressure changes to elevation would just be parallel to this. If you took the water and you threw it down or accelerated it down somehow, then it would actually end up on the other side of this, this curve as a negative pressure. So it all follows from this. So two expressions only that have come out of this. One important one is this one, which says what the inclination of the free surface is. And the second one is this one, which says how pressure changes. With vertical uh, arrangement. And actually, uh, because this is the case, you could surmise that if you drew a contour plot of the pressures below the surface, this would be the pressure at the surface where dp equals zero, right? There's no pressure change as you go across this. It's all atmospheric. A consequence of this behavior that in all slices next to that, it, it would be changing at the gradient that is local. These would all be contours of pressure change at different depths, right? as you could surmise, right? All right? Okay, fantastic, isn't it? Exciting stuff. So, so that's one way to look at things. Let's look at Mr. Science, Mr. Freaky Science. Right at home. I'm just hanging out on a planet in a solar-centric system and going over today's science file. And today's science file, it says... You will need a mug, some ribbon, a plastic tube, and a spool. Start by getting yourself that mug and some ribbon. You're going to tie a few knots around the handle of the mug to secure it in place. Now thread the ribbon through the plastic tube and through the spool as well. Now tie a couple of knots in the ribbon to secure the spool to the ribbon. Now check this out. The mug is definitely heavier than the spool. Now, here's what you're going to do. You're going to give the spool a spin, a lot like this. Ha <laughs> ha! That's so wicked cool! Now, that's pretty wicked cool, but this is the So Cool Science Show, and I, I gotta blow your mind. <laughs> no, no, not literally, I'm not literally.
the, you know, get it blown, get mad. I guess we can stand. Anyway, but you get the rough idea, right? So you have a, a tube, has a string through it, has a small weight on the end, and you spin it. So centripetal force pushes that out, and as a result of that, it lifts the, uh, the weight of the heavier mug through the, the center. And so that's not so different from what you could imagine would happen in a rotating fluid. So if you filled a Tygon tube or a piece of hose pipe, uh, if you could imagine, well, if you stop the end of it and you swing it around your head, you could imagine that the fluid that's in that hose pipe gets pushed to the end of the, the tube. If you remove the end of the tube so it can actually flow out, what it would want to do is get flown out with the tube, and what it would do is it would, if the, the bend of the fluid was actually in, a, in water or in another liquid, it would suck the liquid along that fluid and spin it around the room and soak you all sitting in your seats, of course. And so that's basically the, the mechanism by which a, a centrifugal uh, pump works. Uh, you've all seen that kind of behavior elsewhere. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't need to show any of those. You've seen that uh, in, the, in the bowl of a, of a sink as well, right? When you look at fluid going down a sink, it spins, and it spins so it's almost a little vortex. It doesn't really matter which way it spins around, but you know that at the edge of the, of the container, of the basin, it's at a higher elevation than it is in the center. Bit of a false example. But if you could imagine taking that paint can or a bucket and spinning the water somehow so it's actually moving under its own, you'd get the same behavior. You'd end up with the water piling up on the edges of the bucket and it being uh, depressed in the center of the bucket. And so we can use exactly the same idea for accelerating fluids, but in this centripetal, uh, bless you, this centripetal frame of reference to be able to say something about uh, rotational accelerations. And so I often derive the expressions, but I'm not going to do that today. You can look back at one of the early videos if you want to do that. But basically, the idea is that um, you can use Newton's law of... Uh, of uh, circular motion, which instead of saying, uh, in our case, is F equals MA for linear is something like F equals M, what is it, I know, V theta squared over so this is uh, the equivalent of Newton's law, Newton's second law uh, in a linear sense, which we know. These are accelerations in x, y, and z. This is for acceleration around an axis, where r is the length of the distance out from that axis. And v theta is the velocity. Uh, so this is r. This is the axis, which is the center line, which is this is rotating around. So this is R. And this is the velocity, which is around the circumference of the circle that this weight is tracing as it goes around. So you spin it around. It has some arc to it, a radius. And as it goes around that, it has some local velocity along the circumference of that circle at radius r. And that's what we need. And so what we can do is we can note that phi theta is equal to just the radius multiplied by the angular rotational speed. This is in radians per second. And if you substitute that into here, so if you substitute this into this, you'll get something that includes omega squared, etc. And so these are the, exp the expressions that come out of it. So let's not worry about deriving them, but just let's use them. And so you see that you end up with three expressions. And these three expressions are written in a slightly different coordinate frame. They involve pressure changes within the vertical direction dz, which looks a little bit similar to what we talked about before, because we're not accelerating this up 
or down, we're just spinning it around its axis. If we look at accelerations or pressure changes in the theta direction, so the theta direction would be, uh, this would be theta here. I'm not drawing that very well. This would be this angle. So in other words, you have an axis that this is spinning around. You have a direction which is in the right-handed coordinate system. The vertical axis is z, which is the thumb. The positive rotation direction is looking downwards, it would be counterclockwise, or looking upwards, I guess it would be clockwise, around the fingers, direction of my fingers. And so the direction relative to this, this is theta. So in other words, as you go around, circumscribe around the circumference of the tank, all it's saying is that dp d theta equals zero. All it says is that there's no pressure change as you go around in the circle. So if you start at the surface here and move around, the surface should be horizontal. If you go a meter down below the surface and you scribe around, the pressure there should be exactly the same on all the contours as it goes around here. So that's basically what this is saying. Right, right here. So there's this. This is how pressures change vertically. It's not different from what we had before. And the only new one is how pressures change as we go radially outwards. It says that the pressure change is a function of the density. It's a function of the rotation speed. And of course, this is a rotation speed, but we're talking about accelerating fluids. And so we know that acceleration results from a change in velocity. The, the fluid is going at a constant speed, but it's going at a different velocity because at one moment it's going in this direction, and as it goes around the contour, it's not changing its speed. How do you like this? It's actually changing its direction, right? So that's the other part of uh, velocity. It's changing direction. So it is changing its velocity, even though it's going at the same speed, if that's not oxymoronic and a contradiction in terms. And so it really is a, an accelerating fluid because the direction at which it goes everywhere is, is changing. So the pressure gradient is a function of how far out you are from the center of the axis of rotation and also the square of rotation speed. So you double rotation speed, you double this gradient, and I guess the other thing that you can take home from this is that this pressure gradient changes with radius. So if you go one unit of radius out, then you'd have a certain pressure gradient, which would be some number. If you double that length by going the next amount, then the gradient, instead of being this amount, doubles. And so if it gets steeper as it goes out, then by definition you could imagine that this surface has to be curved. Incrementally, as you get, go out an extra piece of radius, it gets to be a, 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 a more elevated profile. So we can do exactly the same as before. Remember, what we want to do before is, what is the inclination of the surface, and how do pressures change as you go down below that surface? So we can write the pressure on a surface as this. We did it before. Remember, dp is equal to change in pressure in the r direction plus the change in pressure in the theta direction plus the change in pressure in the z direction. We multiply each of these by 1. We assume that because, well, we don't assume, we know that because pressure change as we go around the contour is 0, that this term has to equal 0. And we're left with this expression with dp, not dp equals zero. We can choose that on the surface of the fluid, as we go across, skim across that surface, the pressure is always atmospheric. And so if that's the case, then the pressure doesn't change as we go from one location to another. So we can set this equal to zero. And then we have an expression in terms of the change in elevation as we change radius. So we can just rearrange this into Z, dz dr. Instead of dz dy we had last time, right? This, this flat inclination. And we end up with this expression here. And it says that the gradient changes as a function of radius, which is really what we've just said, is that as we go further out, the, ra the gradient increases. And it's a function of the rotation speed squared. Double the rotation speed, you quadruple all the gradients. 
And so that gives us at least the inclination of it. But we know that because it's not constant, because R changes as we go out, then if you want to look at this profile, this kind of parabolic profile, we have to do something with it. And we can integrate it. So we can take equation 3, and we can write it like this. We can integrate both sides in terms of separating the variables of radius and elevation. And if we do that, then we get an expression. We could either do it by limits between uh, z equals 0 to z, or r equals 0 to r, etc. Or we could do it just getting a constant. And so do it either way. We've done it here with a constant. And so what we could do is we could solve a problem so long as we can figure out what this constant is. And we'll, we'll do an example if we get to it. That is the equation of the surface of the fluid, which is a bowed fluid. And so what it's saying is that the constant would give you the value basically of this point, and it would go up from there. Yeah, basically the constant would be the elevation of this point, and these other terms would give you how the, it would change. Getting a bit short on time, but we could also then take equation 2 again, and we could look at doing the integration with respect to dz. Sorry. And so we get how pressure changes in this particular case. And again, this is just the expression we already had. In this case, we've chosen not to make this equal to 0. And if we do that, we can integrate it. And this gives us the pressure uh, within the system as we go from one location to another. So in other words, if we go uh, to some new radius and to some depth, the pressures change. And you can see that if the depth changes, then we just, because we're not accelerating upwards, it's just the same distribution that we'd have in a static fluid. It just varies with the unit weight multiplied by the elevation. But if we change radius, location horizontally, the pressure will change as we go outwards. And as we go further outwards, the pressure will go up principally because the surface is, is curved. All right? Okay, so how do we use these? So, so basically, not basically, should stop using the word basically. We have two expressions. This is one expression. Which gives you the elevation of the free surface. And the other one is this lower expression of how pressures change, which tell you just that as you go up or down in the fluid, which is rotating, if you choose any, so if this is your center line that's rotating and it's going around, for instance, it would tell you that if you look at the pressure distribution on the side of this tank, this would just be dpdz is equal minus gamma, just the same as in a static tank. That's all the same. And if you went down at this point here, you'd get exactly the same response. However, if you're going up in an elevator, then it would give you the increased pressures due to the acceleration you have. And of course, if you go up in an elevator, you only feel the acceleration when you start out, right? You reach some terminal velocity very quickly. And then you're not accelerating anymore. So you don't feel anything different than if you're just standing statically. Okay? So those are the two expressions to, to remember. How do we use them? So, simple example. So you take a YouTube, a, a, I realized this into this last night on the video, a YouTube, a U shaped tube, not a YouTube, and you fill it with something, and then you spin it around its axis. You can imagine if you flattened out these wings so that they're horizontal, centripetal force would force that fluid to soak you in the audience here. Uh, even if they were slightly inclined, it would possibly push them out. So if it's doing that, you can imagine that you need some tension to hold it in. So there's some tensile force within the, the center. So you'd imagine that as you spin it, you're creating a cavitation force or a pressure, a negative pressure in here just by spinning it, just like you would do in a, um, a um, centrifugal pump. 
And so the question is, if you spin this U-tube uh, around this axis, when do you vaporize the water that's in there? Kind of interesting question, isn't it? And so when will it vaporize? It will vaporize when the P is equal to the vapor pressure. This should be the absolute pressure. If that's the case, then this is going to be the pressure. It's probably going to be easy to work in absolute pressure. So this is actually not atmospheric, but this would be 14.7 PSI in absolute pressure, which is zero gauge. And so what we can do is we can use this expression that we have, the second of these two expressions, this one here. And what we need to do is figure out exactly what this constant is. So let's choose our coordinate system where this is y or r. This is the z direction positively upwards. This here is z equals 0 inches, I guess. It's not in SI. And what, where do we know the pressure? We know the pressure exactly at this point here. And so um, we know the pressure is equal to, if we do it in gauge pressure, then this is 0. This radius here is 4 inches. We have a rotation speed that we don't know. We have a density of water. We have a unit weight of water, which is rho g. And we have an elevation of that point, which is 12 inches. So we know everything in this thing except for the rotation speed and the constant. But we know this has to equal 0. So we can substitute things in and figure out exactly what that constant is. And the constant, because we have an unknown value here, has to contain that. And now, what we can do is we can go back to this expression, same expression here, which is this, where we know everything. So this is the same expression. This is, a, this is the elevation. This has this constant magnitude substituted in on the right-hand side. I didn't mean to. So in other words, you're substituting this constant value. So it's an absolutely a known equation. So once we substitute this constant value in, this term here goes to this. So, so in other words, take this constant, put it into this expression here, and then rewrite it, which is what this expression is here. And then we just need to put the appropriate numbers in here. We want to find out what the pressure is at this point. This is where it's going to cavitate. We know the elevation of this is uh, 0. We know the radius of that point is also 0, right? We know the density of water. And all we need to know is the magnitude of the fluid pressure at which it will cavitate. We did our calculations in gauge pressure. And so we would want to know what the cavitation pressure is in terms of gauge pressure. And that cavitation pressure is going to be 0 0.26 5 PSI, which is the vapor pressure of water, minus atmospheric pressure. So this number here is just PV in gauge pressure. And so if we define this here in terms of gauge pressure, we have everything. The only unknown in this equation should be the value of this rotation speed. Okay. So there's a constant in the equation, so we have to figure out exactly what the constant is. We figure that out by writing the equation to the place where we know that pressure, and then work out what the constant is. Once we know what that constant is, we can use this equation again with that constant in, which is always the same, and figure out what the other terms are.